Rumors have been swirling that the new live action remake of Snow White is going to be canceled. Has it been? I'll give you the answer to that in just a moment, but before we get there, it's important to be brought up to speed. Disney has been on a wild frenzied tour like an unto Bud Light to destroy their brand by emasculating Luke Skywalker, emasculating Han Solo, and then doubling down and emasculating Harrison Ford one more time in Indiana Jones. They've been girl bossing the place up with She-Hulk, sticking it to the patriarchy with the MCU, and basically plastering their gay agenda as far and wide as possible for all the kiddos. Welcoming to like my like not at all secret gay agenda. If you take note that feminism has already been one of the most destructive forces in society as it has single-handedly caused the divorce rate to catastrophically skyrocket, caused abortions to multiply, and been the catalyst for the trans epidemic, it won't come as a surprise to you that this ravenous ideology as it takes place through the form of Kathleen Kennedy is also destroying Disney. The latest attempt to destroy Disney hasn't come from the top, but rather within, because of course, we know that these corporations have not been taken over by their activist employees whatsoever. So femme fatale, Rachel Ziegler, who plays Snow White in the new upcoming live remake, has been doing her dead level best to destroy the movie before it even comes out with comments like these. I just mean that it's no longer 1937, and we absolutely wrote a Snow White she's that is not going to be yeah, saved by the prince. She's not going to be saved by the prince, and she's not going to be dreaming about true love. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. Well, thank God Rachel is here to save us from the patriarchy. This film and its story have been around for decades, but now Rachel and her friends are far too superior for the original message to be told. Girls don't need stupid love, and they definitely don't need stupider men, unless they need something unscrewed. But then basically that's it. Well, that is actually unless they need their houses built that they live in. But other than that, men are basically useless. You do actually need men to survive. And here's why. Everything that you see around you was built and created and maintained by men. A woman can do everything a man can do is the message of the new Snow White according to Snow Brown over here. We are superior to the past is the message and Rachel wants us to take her word on that. This is typical not only of Disney but the cultural left as a whole. They want us to cancel Abraham Lincoln because he just wasn't sufficiently woke enough. And most recently Judy Garland for wearing blackface when she was 13, like 800 years ago. While some conservatives decry this because they think it's unfair that the left wants to use modern standards to judge things in the past, I rather think the real problem is not that it's unfair, but that modern progressivism is so regressive, it's absurd to suggest that we can't judge the recent past. For the same reason, it's also ridiculous to claim that you shouldn't look down on the past because people in the future will do it to us one day. We don't have to wait for the future to judge us, and the recent past has already spoken. We lose. Look around now and you'll see the corpses of 60 million babies from abortions, the mutilation of kids by their parents for TikTok likes, and so much more. Besides, I love it when atheists use this kind of argument that Rachel Ziegler is using about how antiquated things are. Uh, when they talk about the Bible especially, they want us to believe that the Bible is antiquated and that uh, it was written by a bunch of ignorant sheep herders in the Bronze Age. Oddly enough though, these people could write whole books of the Bible from memory and they knew multiple languages, but we today can't even write a text without using an emoji. While many today look down at people from the past for their racism, homophobia, and bigotry, those same people would look at us and say, like, you guys win. You win in the tournament for the worst people ever. Sorry, Rachel, we could use a little bit more real love stories where real men sweep a girl off her much smaller feet. And more often than not, we do not have that in the present. We have to go to the past to find that. But that doesn't stop her from making more great statements and destroying this upcoming film. Then there are 18 hours in a dress of an iconic Disney princess. I deserve to be paid for every hour that it is streamed online. Look up entitled in the dictionary and I promise you, a meme with that girl's face will pop up. No, you don't deserve to get paid for streaming services because you wore a dress. You probably deserve to work at a fast food chain, but you had the misfortune of being thrust into a vain society that only cares about personal appearances and you're slightly pretty, so therefore you got a job paying you handsomely already for wearing a dress. Now that you're up to speed, it's time to answer the question. Has Snow White been canceled? No. It's still gonna happen, but taken together, it should be canceled. 
If you care about the future of movies, you'll send a message before it's too late, before those writers return from strike, and you'll make it known that we don't like the way you guys are writing and making movies. We don't need any more twerking she-hulks. You can stay fired. If you're bold enough to send that message, it might mean better shows and better movies in the future. But you're gonna have to make sure Snow White is one of the biggest flops in American movie history for that to happen. If you do that, Disney and all of their friends will take note. If you do that, we'll see woke feminism crushed under the real god of our age, money. The folks at Disney will respond to your wallet if you have the boldness to start talking with it. And because the left destroys everything it touches, you best start talking now. And we'll see what else they might be up to destroying today on Indie Thinker. Welcome to the show. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget to check out today's show sponsor. Our friends over at Anchor can help you with all of your business solutions. And there is really no better time to start diversifying your income and start building wealth for your family, even if it's with passive income. Now, one of the ways that you can do that is by starting a business. But if you're gonna start a business, you're gonna need some help. You're gonna need some experts in your corner. And I know what you're thinking already. Things are tight. Joe Biden has done the best he can to make sure that Bidenomics destroys everything. Um, and you may not have some extra cash to try to outsource your bookkeeping, your accounting, your payroll, your staffing, and all of these things to an expert. But let me just tell you that money spent now, and by the way, you'll be saving a lot by using Anchor because they have fantastic rates, but money saved now with Anchor will save you money in the long run. There's just some things that you don't want to leave to chance and your family's financial future is one of them. So you need some experts in your corner to help you with all of those things I just mentioned. Bookkeeping, accounting, staffing, payroll, and whatever else you need to make sure that your business is not only compliant but running smoothly. And our friends over at Anchor can help you do that and so much more. But you got to get their name right. Go to A-N-C-U-R dot B-I-Z today and look at all the ways Anchor can help you and whatever small business you want to create. And when you do so, let them know that Indie Thinker sent you. If you went to a public school or had a secular education, I'm sure you have heard in one form or another that Christians are responsible for some of the greatest atrocities in human history. Things like the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition rank up there with just the worst. Now, while Anytime anybody does anything, whether at the hands of a religious person or not, that is a human rights violation, it is horrible, but it might surprise you that in the 250 years of the Spanish Inquisition, only 3,000 people were killed. And it might also surprise you that the bloodiest century in human history, beating out all other centuries before it combined, is the 20th century. And the culprit behind that body count of millions upon millions of dead bodies is, of course, secular humanism, or what I would call leftism. It is leftism that destroys everything it touches. Now, the main reason for this is that leftism places human emotions and feelings above objective truth. It shouldn't come as any surprise to you that when a secular atheistic or a moral agnostic philosophy comes around, that not only do they not have an ability to detail for you and define objective moral values, but they also do not know how to define reality outside of the way that they feel. And that brings us to the modern day left and the president that we presently have in office, because certainly Joe Biden wasn't placed in office because the left has any real objective understanding of what good leadership is. Of course, Joe Biden was voted into office just simply because we needed a grandpa to make us feel better about ourselves in the aftermath of a Trump administration. So, of course, many people didn't take notice of the fact that Joe Biden staged his campaign from a basement and barely did anything and never really came out with any policy procedures that he would run on, but just simply every once in a while showed up at places like the Breakfast Club to declare, you're not black if you don't vote for me and things like that. Um, and ended up winning simply because Biden offered some kind of heartwarming feeling to people whereas Donald Trump stirred up people's visceral emotions. And so again, all I'm saying is, is that the secular left is perfect um, and great at replacing 
uh, logos with, with pathos or replacing truth with, with emotion. And if that weren't so, then why in the world do we continue to prop up Joe Biden as some kind of good president? Now, pushing all of the things with the economy to the side, the man keeps wandering around aimlessly wherever he goes. It's not even funny anymore. Biden just recently wandered away at a Medal of Honor ceremony, leaving everybody in the audience wondering what in the world is going on. Check it out. There he is, folks, our commander in chief. What an inspiration to men, women, and children everywhere. Now, the White House press secretary afterwards told everyone that the reason he just marched off the stage weirdly after presenting this brave man with a Medal of Honor, by the way, who is a Hamilton County resident where I live, um, rather, than, uh, rather than sticking around and celebrating with him, the reason he marched weirdly off stage in front of everybody as they were honoring this man is simply because it was COVID protocol, of course. Just, uh, just like climate change, when you say, um, uh, whenever there's an issue and you don't want to take personal responsibility for it, you say climate change. Of course, whenever you need to just explain the odd behavior of our president, you just say COVID protocol. Uh, so needless to say, uh, this man was left on stage while the president wandered off and left in the middle of the Medal of Honor ceremony. Now, I, I don't take much delight in this because it's actually really sad at the end of the day, but just look at this man's face. He's having one of the greatest moments in probably the history of his life, maybe outside of his kids, his marriage, maybe if he's a Christian knowing Christ. Um, he's having one of the greatest moments of his life right here as he's being presented uh, with a Medal of Honor. But of course, leave it to Joe Biden to absolutely destroy that moment with his wandering awkwardness. But don't worry, the sideshow gets even worse because just recently Biden went to Vietnam and there he was in the middle of asking questions and well, let's just say they had to cut things short. Check it out. If you don't have a game plan, he may have a game plan. He just hasn't shared it with me. But I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go to bed. For, and uh, let's see. I'm just following my orders here. Uh, staff, if anybody hasn't spoken. I ain't calling on you. I'm calling on you. I said they have five questions. I need it. Be away. We talked about making sure that the third world, the, uh, excuse me, third world, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Southern Hemisphere had access to change it, had access. We, it wasn't confrontational at all. You came up with thank, thank you, everybody. This ends thank, the count press thank, conference. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Now, just a couple of things about that clip. Not only did they have to cut the president off because he was meandering around whatever thing he was trying to communicate and was clearly not speaking any kind of logical, coherent English language. But also, we used to hide the fact that these guys had the ability to answer impromptu questions and be spontaneous. Biden has totally taken the, the curtain away from the Wizard of Oz here. And now we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that every single one of these people have been pre-selected when he asked them questions. And every single one of these people have already presented the question to Biden and he knows how to answer it. And he has it on a card written in front of him. We have a president, guys, who cannot answer simple questions without reading from a card. Like, how can we trust this individual with foreign policy when, when he has to read from cards rather than answer questions? Now, all of this is on the eve of Hunter Biden's indictment, which will mean one of two things for this geriatric and very sad old man. One, Biden will have to testify against his son. We'll see how that goes. Or two, Biden will be impeached along with his son being indicted. It seems interesting to me that in a media kind of ecosphere where very often the only stories that you hear are the ones they want you to hear, that this is happening. Because it could just be that these stories are so big that they can't avoid them, but it may also mean something else, that Biden is not going to run in 2024. 
I keep on wondering if this is the case. But more importantly, whether he runs or not, based upon what we're seeing with this man and what we asked for in 2020 in the aftermath of Donald Trump, it's a reminder to me of just this simple fact that secular humanism is completely reductive and irrational. Regardless of whether or not he runs again in 2024, the one thing that you should know is that the bigger the government gets, the smaller the individual gets. And the way in which we idolize our, our leadership class and our elite class is so galling with Joe Biden as president. Let me try to illustrate this for you with just a brief kind of biblical story. There was a time in which people didn't have a government, but had more of a theocracy in, in the Old Testament. And Samuel comes before the people of Israel and he says, hey guys, listen, we, um, we have a choice here to make. You can have a king like everybody else or you can have God lead you, but you can't have both. And I'm just going to tell you, if you choose a king, he's going to put your people in slavery. He's going to put your people to, in military. He's going to take your money. He's going to tax you uh, out the wazoo. All of these horrible things are going to happen. Your sons and your daughters, your sons will go to war. Your daughters will become maids and f into forced servitude. And he lists all of this stuff, and you're almost waiting for them to say, okay, well, give us God. But of course, the end result of that story is that the people demand for a king in spite of the fact that their kings are so broken and obviously going to do things that will not benefit the people. I can't help but think about that story as I see our president. Perhaps Joe Biden is exactly what we ask for when we consistently looked to the government to be our saving grace rather than God. Listen, you may be atheist, you may be agnostic, but at least I hope you can see the reason and the rationale behind this simple statement. The idea that I just mentioned that the smaller God gets, the bigger government gets. Ultimately, I'm saying that just simply because we're going to look to somebody for help. We're going to look to somebody outside of ourselves. Now, it can either be the government or it can be God. Which do you think would be better suited for you? And I know there are going to be many people who watch this and they say, well, why do we have to choose either of those two things? All I'm going to tell you is that that's the way it typically works out. That's what this Bible story is actually telling us. And it actually has some wisdom to share with us in the present. Somebody is going to lead your life. It's not just going to be you independently, autonomously leading your life. Something is going to lead you. And you'd be way better off with a smaller government and a bigger God. Just saying. Now, to try to even push a little bit forward into some of those spiritual truths that our society, the more secular it gets, could really, you know, could really stand to revisit, I want to take you to Frank Turek, who is a Christian speaker, Christian evangelist, and apologist. And I want to share an interaction that Frank had with a woman in his audience because I believe it is representative of many of the the questions people have about Christianity and the worldview that's there. But more importantly, I believe it is representative of how secularism has fueled the way that we think in ways that we do not even realize. Uh, and that's, that's across the board, whether you're a believer or a religious person or, or not. But I also think I have a couple of little nuances that obviously in the heat of the moment, you don't always think about these things that might perhaps be helpful to add to the conversation between Frank and this woman. So I want to show you a clip of it real quick. Here's that. They're not necessarily eyewitness accounts. They're written in the third person. And the reason why we have the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is thanks to the Catholics putting those labels on there. So I guess I don't understand why you say they are eyewitness accounts. Okay, I want to stop real quick and just say this. So, um, these eyewitness accounts written in the third person present absolutely no issue for me and they shouldn't for you either. It's not odd for a third person to compile eyewitness accounts. That's exactly what the Bible claims to be. 
Um, but the implication here, and this is going to come into um, come into effect in just a moment here. The implication here is that hey, these guys are in somehow colluding. They're just sharing the same story. This is some story that they told each other, um, and they're all just writing the same thing. So we can't necessarily even trust that these are eyewitness accounts. These are just dudes that are sharing some story because they're propagandist or some such nonsense. Okay, so that is the initial claim of this individual and the the argument that she's trying to make. So let's hear her out um, and hear whether it is true that there's collusion going on or maybe something else. So let's continue. Why do I think they're eyewitness accounts? Right. Because they contain eyewitness data. Like for example, the Gospel of John, there are 59 eyewitness details in that, in that document called the Gospel of John that could only have been known by an eyewitness or somebody who knew an eyewitness. Okay, is it possible that someone could have just been writing a story? Well, then you'd have to discount all the other evidence that this is, doesn't appear to be a story, it appears to be a historical account. From, because the, from the Bible, right? The Bible is writing about, like Mark is the first gospel that was written. And Probably, uh, some think Matthew may have been written first. Most scholars say Mark was written okay. first. Okay, so we'll go with the general consensus, I guess. And then they say maybe Matthew and Luke used a lot of Mark. That's why there's a lot of coinciding events. And if you ever read the um, Gospels horizontally, mm -hmm. where you compare each resurrection mm -hmm. account, mm -hmm. there seems to be a lot of contradictions, and it's not just an eyewitness What would those problem. contradictions No, wait a second. We started off first saying that these eyewitness accounts are just compiled third-person uh, you know, uh, compilations of the story, but now we hear something different. We hear that there's contradictions, and by the way, she's referring to uh, what is called a harmony of the Gospels. If you take the synoptic Gospels, which means the same Gospels, Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, and you put them together, uh, you can see how these stories uh, cohere with one another, and of course, uh, there are, I won't say billions because there's not, but there's, there's thousands if not tens of thousands of harmonies of the gospel where you can see these stories compared with each other and you can see if they true, truly do contradict each other. So I find this is interesting because she starts off by saying that there's all these eyewitness accounts and they're just basically collusions. Um, and, uh, but now she's claiming that there's contradictions. And I find that this is true of atheists. They want their cake and they want to eat it too. They want to claim on the one hand that there's too, mu too much kind of like sharing going on um, and that all these people are just kind of working together to try to tell this fairy tale story or that there's just all these contradictions in the Bible. And by the way, I just love that too. The vast majority of the time when somebody says there's contradictions in the Bible and you ask them, okay, like what? They have nothing. And of course, what the woman offers here is not a contradiction. Um, if you look at a harmony of the gospels and you look at the resurrection story, there certainly is thing, there are things that are omitted in some versions that are, that are included in others, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there is some type of contradiction just because a detail was omitted. The omission of a detail is not a contradiction. It's just the omission of a detail. Frank handles that really well and he pinpoints that, but I would highly encourage you to take effort yourself because Christians don't have anything to hide here and go look at a harmony of the gospels, look at the resurrection accounts and what you can see is if you're not interested in trying to prove your point and not interested in trying to have it both ways where you say the Bible's guilty of omission, but it's also guilty of collusion. Uh, but if you're willing to be objective and come to the Bible and, and see those stories, in particular the, the resurrection account, you'll see a way that those stories all cohere with one another and actually presents a chronological narrative of what took place um, with, with no contradictions included. So again, contradictions are all kind of a red herring that are often used by skeptics. They just say the word and they think it carries some kind of epistemic weight with it. But the real problem here is what we'll see at the very end of this clip. Check it out. It's the thing that makes the Bible unbelievable are the miracles that are in it. 
What, meaning you're ruling out miracles. Anything that has a miracle in it, you won't well, believe. Well, you want to say the ancient world. You want to probably, I, Caesar, I can believe what I read about him because he doesn't claim to do miraculous things. So at the beginning of this clip, we hear her talking about the eyewitness accounts and that it's really flimsy to take these eyewitness accounts. But her problem isn't the eyewitness accounts really at the end of the day because here now we have the problem with the eyewitness accounts. It's just that they're not trustworthy because it contains miracles. Well, here's the real problem with that. While sure, the general scholarly consensus is that miracles don't happen, therefore you must discount all of these miracles from ever happening and you must push those to the side and kind of look at the internal evidence of the scripture beyond those miracles to see if it's actually true. Um, you know, pushing that aside, here is what I hope every rational and even every scholar can agree with because I've been in these scholarly circles and I've actually studied text criticism of the scripture. And what I know is this, is that no scholar worth, worth their salt would ad admit that you should read a historical text and read your presuppositional biases into the text. That is almost always going to give you a wrong impression of what's included and what's, what information the text can actually tell you. You're constantly going to be looking for ways in which you can throw it out rather than see if it actually has any merit to it. So the real problem here with this skeptic, with this young woman, is that her presuppositional worldview is influencing the way that she reads the text. In other words, she doesn't want it to be true, therefore it will never be true. She can't look at the eyewitness accounts and see if they're credible from a historical perspective, from an archaeological perspective, even from a rational basis, because there is no way in which she comes to the text open-minded to whether or not it may be true. This is the real problem with secularism and atheists and agnostics when they try to come to a, a historical text like the Bible. They're not actually doing scholarly work when they do so. They're looking for ways to try to justify their priors. This is something called eisegesis. You're reading your beliefs into the text rather than exegesis. And now let me be really clear. The idea of there being kind of a uh, impartial observer is, is not true. All of us are going to allow our priors to be read into a text whenever we read it. The real difference between a person who is a scholar or a person who's being rational and trying to be intellectually honest and a person who is not is that the person who tries to make sure that they understand all of their biases and push them to one side before they read the text is the person who's being truly intellectually honest. The person who automatically has their mind made up and then reads that into the text is always going to come away with what they already believed in the first place. So here's the big problem with this. It's never that there's not evidence to believe. It's just that people don't want to believe. There is ample evidence in Scripture outside of the scripture and extra biblical literature and things like Josephus and Pliny the Younger and all sorts of other historical resources that you can read to try to back up what we find in the scripture. And of course, there's a huge conversation about extra biblical literature and all of that stuff, but suffice to say, the one thing you can't do is just immediately discount the eyewitness accounts of scripture as unreliable simply because you don't like them. Here's what I know at the end of the day, that it's easy for you to say, well, I'm too smart. I don't have to believe in anything. I don't need religion as a crutch. But what you don't realize is the ways in which your secular worldview has influenced the way that you see the world. A lot of atheists will claim that they don't have a worldview. I think that's absolutely absurd. Of course they do. And we all do. And we need to be mindful about the ways in which even the culture has influenced the way that we think about many things. And we'll try to do that in our final segment, Bible Study with Democrats. Oh God of pronouns. Atheism is a religious worldview. That comment will come as a great shock that will send atheists and agnostics into complete terror because they try to deny that there is no such thing as an atheist worldview. But any rational person knows that whether you believe God exists or believe that he doesn't, you're espousing a belief, and not only a belief, but a belief in the most substantive aspect of human life. The implications of which impact and influence your thinking on a regular basis, whether you know it or not. As more information comes to light about the fires in Maui, more of this truth comes to the fore. 
We now know that roads were closed, trapping people in the fire. The emergency alarms weren't sounded when the fires first started, which would have provided much needed time for the people to evacuate. And water in some places was allegedly rationed and kept from people who needed it to fight the fire. And public officials are on record making some pretty shady real estate deals prior to this fire. We've even seen some of the pagan beliefs of the left come to light like in this clip. The commission is responsible per, per our authorizing statute to protect and manage all water resources in the state. One water is like taking it and looking at it from a holistic system perspective. And that's not dif any different than how Hawaiians traditionally manage water. You know, in, in essence, we treated it, uh, Native Hawaiians treated water as one of the earthly manifestations of a god and a kua, kane. And so that reverence, um, for a resource and that reciprocity in relationship was was something that was really really important to our worldview and and well-being right and living in an island in isolated from other you know civilizations um and so i think where it shifted to today or over time is that we've become used to looking at water as like something which we use and not necessarily something w that we revere as that thing that gives us life, right? I mean, to me, it's a shift in value set. Um, and, you know, if we can start to really look at how we as humans in an island um, can reconnect to that traditional value set. So really my motto is always like, let water connect us and not divide us. Like we, we can share it, but it requires true conversations about equity. So much for the left not allowing their religious views to influence what they do. Here on the website for the emergency management in Maui is the profile of the man you just heard, Kaleo Manuel, where it says he wants to bring his indigenous knowledge to the role of water advocacy. This secular leftist may not be the best representative of the modern atheist, but he certainly is the logical conclusion of a secular society. Hopefully by now you realize the Bible was right. There's nothing new under the sun. And as the West has become less Christian, it didn't really become agnostic. It became pagan. And there has been no real like atheistic civilization in the history of the world. We simply replaced Judeo-Christian belief with past pagan practices, like for instance, sacrificing cows to appease Gaia in the hopes that limiting their farts will stave off climate change. We abort our babies in the hopes that we can stave off the pressures of adult life. All of it is perfectly pagan and perfectly biblical. One almost waits for an altar of Molech to show up at gender clinics or Planned Parenthood rather than a chapel. Uh, G.K. Chesterton was right when he said this, that when people quit believing in God, they'll believe in anything. I've covered this on the show, The Dangers of Secularism, numerous times, but I've always tried to prove that leftism specifically and secularism generally do not have reprieves from whatever you believe to be the negatives of religious thought. They are simply a substitute for good religious thought. I can show you that here. Pope Francis has had some things to say about conservative Catholics that have gone viral. He said this, The loudest voices in American Catholicism are backward-looking, bunch of hayseed hicks in your moral values. Uh, backward-looking moralist, disconnected from the roots of the church. Catholic tradition and history, Francis said, is about moving forward, changing to live the gospel message in the midst of current realities. The Pope's words were both surprisingly frank and frankly unsurprising, given the persistence of right-wing anger directed at his modernizing approach. Rome is now the engine of reform, a historic reversal. Francis is a world leader in combating climate change, and he insistently decries economic injustice and the treatment of migrants while putting a new emphasis on the universal right to health care. Housing and decent jobs sounds more like Barack Obama than the Pope. Though Francis is opposed to abortion as any of his predecessors, he sees the issue as part of the entire package of Catholic teaching on protecting and promoting life. Indeed, in Portugal, Francis criticized the fixation on sins below the waist, while if you exploited workers, if you lied or cheated, it didn't matter. Okay, I just love this, kind of uh, worrying about sexual mores more than we actually do about anything else, as if sexual mores weren't actually a big deal. So here's the sum total. Francis is a progressive theologian with Pope attire. That's it. Now, I want to make sure that you understand something, too, because a lot of people question, well, what about papal infallibility, right? So the Catholics, 
who believe that the Pope is, you know, the, the vicar of Christ. Uh, he's stating things that are clearly unbiblical as though they were biblical. So doesn't this mean that the Catholic religion uh, is false in its terms of, of what it believes about the Pope? Well, what you should know about papal infallibility, and by the way, you can fill the world with the kind of ignorance about what evangelicals know about Catholicism, and I being an evangelical and making that statement, um, what you should know about papal infallibility is it doesn't mean that whatever the Pope says is infallible. It just, because he's still human. Every Catholic understands this, and he's, he's fallible. The in, papal infallibility means this. When the Pope is speaking on behalf of orthodox Catholic doctrine, that is infallible. In other words, when the church has declared something an objective, uh, biblical, universal truth, like Jesus is God and there is no salvation under any other name, um, that is when the, when the Pope says those things, that is when he is being infallible. So ultimately, all it's saying is that Orthodox Christian teaching is infallible. That, that Christian truth is objectively true no matter what anybody feels about it. That's what papal infallibility actually means. Now, it's when he wanders off the reservation and then starts charting into leftist territory where we understand the dude is being incredibly fallible. Because the real problem today is not Christianity, it's not religion as a whole, but it's the kind of religion that we see in society today, which pops up in leftism, secularism, postmodernism, and it is the real problem. I want to show you some celebrity testimonies because I think they're powerful, but they'll also illustrate something very, very powerful. And that is the reality that you never hear these stories coming from the left. From the left, you get moralistic teaching that requires something for you to do, but never for the speaker to do. They're never holding themselves accountable. It's always you who pays the price. Democrats trot off to the World Economic Forum in their personal jets and you're left holding the paper straw desperately trying to drink that Starbucks drink that you just paid $10 for. But more importantly, there's no personal accountability in the faith of the modern day secularist. I mean, just listen to Jake Tapper's interview with an attorney looking into the Maui fires. He's not sure how much the power company is at fault when they didn't turn the power off given the extreme winds and storms that were coming through, but he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt the one thing that is to blame is the sun. Check it out. Responsibility do you think the power company bears here for the fire? Uh, it's a very good question. Two days in, which was on the 10th, I asked my attorney general, instructed her to do a comprehensive investigation. So she's doing that right now. She's brought an outside investigator in uh, from the mainland that has fire expertise. She's going to find out exactly how much. We do know that uh, that early fire was sparked, as, as Hiko said. I don't want to jump to conclusions just because I don't think it's fair for me to do that. But we will hold everyone accountable 100 percent and we'll be very transparent about it. We'll release all the reports. I think that in the end of the day, we all have to acknowledge that this is a global problem. It was a very, very hot, dry, terrible storm. We are dealing with global warming here. We had I show you that to contrast the kind of stories people tell when they really believe in Christ. They tell stories about addictions being crushed, marriages being restored, and sin being acknowledged. Check it out first. Here's Hulk Hogan, then Little Richard in Denzel Washington in that order. What you get in these stories is something you never hear from the atheist, something you never hear from the agnostic, and something you never hear from the modern day leftist. No one tells you how much not believing in God has changed their life. Check it out. Mr. Hank Lindstrom hit me hard with the John 3.16. You know, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believed you know, that He gave His Son will not perish but have everlasting life. And I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was 14. But then I derailed, you know, kept playing music and rock and roll bands and got way away from my faith. And then as the years went by, you know, I started seeing how things went. And it's got me to the point now where I'm locked back in. I'm locked and loaded, you know, after all the life experiences and, you know, seeing how people live and what money does to people, you know, and, you know, okay, money makes it easier, but it's not the live and die all situation that some people say it is, you know. And it's just that, that relationship I have, not so much with religion, but with my Lord and Savior is what I function on. You gave your life to Christ at what age? 
well, a couple of three times, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you had to make sure. You had to make sure. Okay, so I, I, gave it. It, I gave it up. You know, early on, I was like, shoot, this is it. Then I was like, and this is, I'm laughing, but I was filled with the Holy Ghost, and it scared me. I said, well, wait a minute, I didn't want to go this deep. You know, mm. I didn't want to party, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, in, in fact, in, in uh, 1981 or 82, Robert Townsend took me. Yeah. I went to yeah. church with Robert Townsend, and, and when it came time to come down to the altar, I said, you know, this time I'm just going to go down there and give it up and see what happens. And I went in the prayer room and gave it up and let go and experienced something I've never experienced in my life. And, and I, I remember calling my mother afterwards and asking her, I said, well, you know, it felt like I was going up in the air and, and my cheeks were filled. And she said, oh no, that's the devil you purging. I said, yeah, yeah, my <laughs> cheeks were filled. And it's, but it was, it was, it was a, it was a, a supernatural, if not once in a lifetime experience, once in this lifetime experience, that I couldn't completely understand at the time. My father, I didn't do what he wanted me to do, and so he told me I had to get out. Mm -hmm. He said, Richard, you, I want, I was gay, and, and he says that I wanted seven boys, and you are messing it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And my brother's name was Charles, so I would go out in the yard and call him. I had a high voice. I would say, Charles! He said, I'm going to kill you tonight. <laughs> he said, I'm going to kill you because I, I was really flamboyant, so my, my people didn't like it. So my dad said, you either follow this rule or get out. Yeah. So I got out because I wanted to wear all of my stones. Now, how, my old, how old were you when you hit the road then, when he tossed you out? I was old enough to go in the streets because I had to be, because I had to find a place. My mother didn't want me to go. I was about 17, yeah. 16 or now, 17. Now, is your father still alive? No, dad is dead. He didn't live to see me, my fame or nothing. And Did so, you ever get this worked out, or was it a, a problem the rest oh, of Oh, no, but God gave me the victory. I, I'm not gay now, but, you know, I was gay all my life. I believe I was one of the first gay people to come out. But God let me know that he made Adam be with Eve, not Steve. <laughs> so, uh, 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 so I just uh, I gave my heart to Christ. After showing you that, I want to assure you my position on celebrity Christian culture has not changed, and I've talked about it multiple times on the show. I'm not a fan of celebrity bandwagons, especially when they become Christians two minutes ago, and now they're hearing, and now we're hearing their take on the wisdom of the ages. But it's not really celebrity that's the problem. It's the fact that what we value in society is what makes someone famous, and we value all the wrong things. We value looks over brains, muscles over wisdom, and nudity over decency. By virtue of that, the celebrities that become famous, given that worldview, are often more spiritually and mentally bankrupt people than we often see in regular society. But that's not always the case. All of this is to warn you. The left never produces stories like this. Name the people who have been bettered in our world because they abandoned Christianity and they picked up leftism. The reason you can't name them is because there are none. All of that to say this, Kaleo Manuel and Pope Francis, you guys need Jesus. And you really only have two choices at the end of the day. Religious conservatism that believes in the Jesus of the Bible or religious progressivism that believes in the Jesus of culture. Choose the former. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and to go with God.